Okay. The following interview was conducted with Professor Leslie Geddes for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, September 5, 2007 at his office in the Biomedical Engi Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Also sitting in is his wife, Professor Linnell Geddes, and David uh, Lassiter, the development officer for the Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering. Welcome. This is part two, and uh, this one will be devoted more to the concept and uh, many of the things that you've led that le have led to patents. We all know about your inventions, but how were they invented? Let us discuss how you proceed through the process of developing a given biomedical device. How do you define the problem? Well, Deve I, develop. Know, I'll read this, and then you can we'll go me, now, right. Signal. Right. How do you define the problem? Develop the concept to produce a product to solve the problem. Test the product and develop it for commercial distribution. Not so much the devices you have invested in, but the procedure following during the invention process. And then we'll talk about some of the special ones, but why don't you take that? All right. Ahead. The, the starting point is to recognize the need of something that uh, is, is not present or something that is present and not uh, adequately suitable for the task it's supposed to perform. <clears throat> and uh, then, then the next step is to get an inspiration and do what they call a feasibility study. This is a study in which you're testing the, 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 the principle. Does it work or does it work? Does it work with difficulty or does it work easily? And, and then, then one thinks of uh, who, is, who needs this device? <clears throat> and, and, the, and the next thing you think of is uh, uh, is it going to be cost competitive with, with other devices? But my philosophy has always been to think of um, better ways of catching mice rather than building a better mouse trap. And, and so you have to be able to think uh, out of the box, as they say these days, think unconventionally. And that, that, those are really the essentials of, of, of getting started on uh, working on an invention. Okay, and then the next stage, then uh, the, you develop the concept, then uh, you have to do some testing as well. Oh Jimmy, yes, you do, right. you do some testing, and the next thing you do is uh, file a, what is called an invention disclosure with the university. And this, this um, is a description, your description of, of the invention, uh, the invention disclosure also contains questions about competitive technology and uh, potential licensees and things like that, and <clears throat> that invention disclosure goes to the patent uh, patent committee, and if the patent committee approves, then the, an attorney is hired to do a search of the literature, literature to find out if uh, the, uh, the device or a similar device has been patented, <clears throat> and then that the uh, patent search comes back, and you look at it, and you then you start negotiating with the attorney so that you can understand each other because attorneys uh, uh, speak a very funny English, and they talk to attorneys, not to, not to mortals. And so then, then the attorney will take the, take the uh, invention disclosure and your, and your amended description and take it and put it in uh, legal language. And, and, uh, and uh, the, in, the invention disclosure, or the, the patent, I'm sorry, the patent application <clears throat> contains the, an abstract of what, you, of what you're up to, and then uh, the background literature and the claims you make for it. And the claims you make are, are the uh, statements at the end of the patent, which uh, tells what the, the uh, patent is, what the discovery is all about, and what it uh, is used for. And uh, it, it's a teaching tool. It te teaches anybody uh, how to make the device, and that's the that's the uh, the uh, price you pay. You have to give it all away. But when you do that and have a patent issued, it is it prevents anybody else from doing the same thing. And so that takes about uh, maybe maybe a year and a half, two years, and then it takes two years for the patent office to to issue a patent, except. If you're a senior citizen, you get ex expedited review because they're afraid you might die during the patent process. You're sure they're not taking into consideration your, your senior uh, status and being in the field? <laughs> no, no, it's, it's your age. It, 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 used, it used to take two years or longer. Uh -huh. uh, the patent office is overloaded with patents. Uh, 
but uh, if you're a senior citizen, you can get expedited review. You, have you, you get office action uh, on the way through, and that's office action is the, a, a report by the patent examiner who wants more information or will say that this is uh, not novel enough. And to get a patent, you, you, uh, you don't have to invent something new. The, uh, uh, the uh, collection and, and use or implementation of known technologies for a novel use or to solve a new problem it is, is a patentable. Okay. Right. How do you form a team to complete the invention? Well, that all gets down to leadership and, and, and uh, you form a team by showing, uh, doing it, doing something yourself and showing that it works. And then they get enthusiastic about uh, working on the project and then they start contributing ideas. Uh, one of the most rewarding things is uh, a question like, well, couldn't we use it for this or couldn't we use it for that? In other words, they may see an unanticipated uh, use. And uh, when, when you hear that kind of a thing, you know you're, you're on your way. Mm -hmm. When you select your team, is it pr primarily people uh, within the school? Yes, they, they can be undergraduates as well as graduate students, and they also can be staff. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, Purdue has, has a, a good patent uh, policy in that undergraduates can be uh, inventors too. I have a couple of, I have one undergraduate that's an inventor on two patents and uh, another one who will about, is about to be. So it, 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 it's, uh, there's a reward and the, the uh, in, inventors get uh, divide one third of the royalties. Purdue gets one third and the, the, the department or laboratory, laboratory of origin gets one third of the royalties. So it's, it's a it's a win-win situation. All right, let's move on to some of the ones. Let's start with the medical monitoring devices that aided in putting the first people in space. Some years ago you were involved in that. Yes, that was an interesting situation. I was at Baylor Medical College at that time, and uh, uh, I was a consultant to the Air Force uh, at Brooks Air Force Base, and uh, NASA wanted a consultant, so they hired me as a consultant. I was a professor of physiology at that time at Baylor, Baylor Medical College, and uh, not, nothing much happened. Uh, we, uh, we weren't used very much because the, the, program, the space program had started, and they flew the first uh, Mer Mercury uh, mission. And after, they, after that, they came to me and said, uh, Dr. Geddes, could you uh, help us? And I said, oh, sure, what, what would you like? And they said, well, the, uh, the, we lose, lose respiration. They were uh, trying to, to bring back four vital signs, temperature, heart rate, uh, um, 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 TPR and BP, temperature, pulse rate, and, and blood pressure. And uh, they said, uh, when the astronaut turns his head, we lose respiration. Well, the way they were detecting respiration was a, a little heated device in, in the microphone that was stuck to the helmet. So when the, the astronaut exhaled, he cooled this little device, and that provided an electrical signal uh, that, would, that uh, counted respiration. That was telemeter to, to Earth. And so they said, we want to record respiration throughout the whole, the whole uh, mission. And I said, uh, they said, could you, could you do something for us? I said, sure. So I went uh, back to the laboratory on a Saturday afternoon and realized that when, uh, when you inspire, air comes in and, and uh, fills the chest, and air is a, is a good insulator. So I put electrodes across the chest and measured the conductivity of the chest, and sure enough, the conductivity decreased during inspiration and uh, uh, increased during expiration. <clears throat> well, we, 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 we developed that device at, at the medical school, and we had to find a contractor for NASA, and it was a company in St. Louis that did the, did the, the manufacturing but they couldn't make them for the next flight. So they came and used our student laboratory units for the, next, for the uh, ground uh, monitoring uh, on, on the next flight. And so we, we had our, our student respiration units. Uh, one of them went on the flight. Oh, very, very good. Yeah. And uh, then, then finally, uh, they, uh, they were a little worried about getting heart rate. Uh, they didn't want to put too many things on the, on the astronaut. So I figured out that these electrodes across the chest had the heart between them. So with a little uh, uh, electronic trickery, we were able to get the, uh, the electrocardiogram and respiration from the same pair of electrodes. 
And that principle is used in all patient monitors today. Okay. We weren't smart enough to patent it. We published it. It's published in aerospace medicine. We were so happy it worked that uh, we just uh, let it go. I see. Okay. Here's another one. Uh, that uh, regenerative tissue graft that's made from the layer of your, from the submucosa. Uh, how did that come about? It's that was about very, that. that was a pure, pure uh, accident. Uh, <clears throat> what we had been doing was thinking about <clears throat> using, uh, at that time, lung transplantation was totally unsuccessful. So we recognized the need for uh, uh, oxygenating blood. So we decided that uh, the way to oxygenate blood is to put it through some place uh, where there's blood flowing <clears throat> with low oxygen content. Well, the, the big, big vessel, the inferior vena cava, that returns to the heart has the, has the most unsaturated blood, the most the blood with the least oxygen in it. So we, we decided that, well, what we will do is put a catheter in there and inject micro bubbles, little, little tiny bubbles, and they, 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 there's, the, the blood is so hungry for oxygen, the bubble would be absorbed uh, right away. It wouldn't go very far uh, down the, downstream as, as a bubble. Well, we got an animal and we made a catheter with a little micron size catheter little tubes in it and put it in and, uh, and injected oxygen and, and uh, by golly the, the uh, cardiac arrhythmia occurred the heart became irregular and we didn't expect that at all the heart became very irregular so we decided we better stop and, uh, and do a, a what they call an in vitro study and that is a, a study in, in, in a glass tube and, and in fluid <coughs> put the catheter with all these little tubes in it in a vertical tube and, uh, in, in, and had the, had the uh, water flowing in the tube and we injected the micro bubbles and sure enough they, they came out like, like bubbles out of a pop uh, drink or out of champagne or out of beer and they all got, got together downstream into one great big bubble. So uh, surface tension beat us on that. So we, that was a, a good idea that, that uh, physics was against it. So we then decided, well, we need an area uh, where you don't contact blood, but it has lots of surface area. <clears throat> and we got to thinking about, well, where in the body is that? Well, you have 30 feet of small intestine, and that's a good absorbing area. So we decided that we would put a tube down the, down the esophagus into the stomach and into the small intestine and inject oxygen and look at the blood draining this, this uh, small intestine. And by golly, the venous blood turned bright red. It worked great. And the only problem is that the blood flow through the small intestine is very, very little, except when you're digesting food. So uh, they, we, we could oxygenate the blood, but we, wouldn't, we could not add very much oxygenated blood to the circulation. So we decided that's another good idea that didn't work. <clears throat> so we decided, well, what can we do with this 30 feet of intestine? And uh, we thought, well, I remembered that if you have an ulcer in the small intestine and it bleeds, the blood does not clot. So I thought, ah, oh, that's a good blood vessel. So let's make an artificial blood vessel from that. And this is, this is two failures now, and here's the third one we're looking at. So we decided to, to um, replace the, the aorta beyond the kidney with, with a piece of the, of the animal's small intestine. We didn't want any, uh, any cross um, uh, uh, species contamination or cross uh, 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 animal contamination. So we put the, we made a, n a nice uh, surrogate artery, uh, surrogate aorta, and the team was uh, uh, Steve Badalak, who was an MD and a PhD in, in uh, pathology, Gary Lance, who was a veterinary surgeon, Art Coffey, who was a medical student at that time at, at IU, and myself, and we, we put, put uh, an infrarenal aorta in, and uh, it's called small intestine submucosa, and uh, the following morning the um, abdomen was full of blood, and I said, come on fellas, uh, do a little better surgery than this. So they said, okay, and they did the same thing again, abdomen was full of blood again. So we took another animal, and uh, Steve Adelak recognized that we'd left this, the digestive mucosa intact. 
So he turned the little specimen inside out, scraped it off, and then we inverted it and, and scraped off the muscle. Now it's a layer of acellular collagen. Well, we put that in the third animal, and the, animal, the following day the animal was fine. Days after, the animal was happy as can be. And we wondered, what, what do we do? Do we go in and find out why we have this success, or what do we do? So we decided to do nothing and just see how long the animal lived. And then we started to do uh, um, animal studies every, uh, after, every, uh, after every week. And we, uh, uh, after about two months, the animals were all living. And the original animal was living. And the original animal lived five years and died of old age. And so we, we uh, then uh, got courage enough to go in and look at this piece of uh, uh, small intestine we put in. And you could not tell it from native adjacent aorta. In histologically, obviously it looked the same, but histologically, when you did the, the cellular, cellular studies, it, it, had con, it had converted, or they call remodeled, to become uh, uh, native uh, tissue. And that was a property that we didn't know it had because uh, we didn't know its composition. It was collagen, but we didn't know that that collagen has growth factors in it. And it's the growth factors that uh, do the remodeling and the, and the small intestine is a scaffold. And so then it worked and we got a patent on it and licensed it. And uh, uh, now there's several companies with licenses and there's 250,000 people with uh, small intestine submucosa implanted somewhere. And the good thing is it, it, will, it will become native tissue wherever you put it, with, ex with the exception of within the brain and spinal cord. Mm. Very good. Okay. It, it even makes myocardium, it even makes it, we patch the heart with it. Okay. And, it, and tendons, ligaments, and, and uh, bladder and stomach, we've patched all of those organs with, the, with this stuff. Okay. Well, it's, it's, oh, it's all part. Okay. Is Emil out there? Is Emil out there? Is Emil out there? Pardon? Uh, I don't see her. I do not see her. He's okay. a him. <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't know if there'll be time for this, but I bet uh, Ronell can ask him some really good questions. <laughs> You're playing decent. You know the honeymooners. Oh yes. At the end of the at the end of the the, the show, he would come out uh, off out of character and walk across the stage with a with a cup of coffee and he'd say how sweet it is it's got rum in it <laughs> <laughs> that's Jackie for you <laughs> yeah <laughs> well in your case it's the rum it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, Manhattan, Manhattan. Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. we'll switch tapes then afterwards right after yeah okay that. we got about 12 minutes and we have another tape uh, um, well, the uh, the next one that I'd like to um, and we'll all blending it in with what we talked about earlier about the process of developing a given biomedical, and these are the one, many of the ones that you have done. The uh, automated miniature de defibrillator, uh, which is small enough to implant inside a person. Well, it's 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 more than that. It's uh, we we didn't create the implantable one. We created what you need to make an implanted one. Okay. And that uh, came. And as a matter of fact, it was Norman Weldon who came to us in 1974 after we got here and said, Les, I want you to make an implanted defibrillator. I said, Norman Weldon, you're out of your mind. I said, nobody knows how to do that. And, and, and uh, I said, uh, it has to de do two things. It's got to detect the electric electrical activity of the heart and the absence of mechanical activity. I said, we don't know how to do that. He says, don't talk like that. He says, I'll come back in a few months and you'll have it solved. And he did and we had it solved and so he gave it. How much did it what cost? I said $25,000. He says, you got it. And so he gave us the money and I appointed Joe Borland as the, as the chief engineer on the project. And we made it, made it work and uh, we tested it. And it, 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 there's no defibrillator today that d d detects both the electrical activity and the loss of mechanical activity. We patented it and nobody was interested. They thought the electrical activity of the heart is all you needed. And we knew that that was wrong and that the patent has expired. And uh, I was talking to Medtronic about uh, a few months ago, and they, they, they didn't know of the patent. I said, I'll send you a copy, and I did. And they thanked me, and they're working on it. 
Now that the patent has expired, what it's uh, our, anybody, somebody, anybody, anybody can, can use it. Can was use it used that. quite a bit? Uh, was was it used in any uh, clinical trials or anything Never. of that sort? Oh, it was, yes, yeah. it was used clinically. It was used uh, in in uh, in Canada. We had clinical trials in in uh, it was in uh, Hamilton, I think, Ontario. Mm -hmm. okay. And it, and it, it it not only did it do what it was supposed to do, it, it defibrillated with two thirds less energy. And that in itself is, is attractive because that means the battery battery life would be much much longer. Right. Exactly. Okay. How about the pacemaker? Um, that's uh, one of the things that you worked on. Tell us. To go yes, on to that one. The, the pacemaker was quite by accident. I had been interested in the history of uh, physiology for some time and uh, knew a little bit about uh, the the, uh, the the workings of the heart and knew about the, the historical discoveries associated with the circulation. And uh, Bill Cook called me one day and said, uh, I understand you're going to be in uh, New York uh, to, to attend a meeting. I said, yes. He says, are you bringing your senior staff with you? I said, yes. He says, well, come and uh, uh, visit me at the New York Hilton on uh, Friday night. And he gave me the date. So I went in and we went in and uh, I saw a bottle of Glenlivet uh, on the table. That's, that's Highland malt whiskey, a single malt whiskey. I, I knew I was in trouble because uh, uh, he knew I liked it. So <laughs> he didn't say anything for a long time. But he started to drink the, the Highland malt whiskey, and everybody was happy. And then he dropped the bomb on me. He says, Les, he says, uh, I just bought a company that uh, makes pacemakers. And I said, Bill, you're out of your mind. I said, at this time, the pacemaker companies were in, 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 in real trouble because they were being accused of paying surgeons uh, to implant their pacemakers or giving them trips or something like that to implant their pacemakers. And I said, this is not a good time to, to talk about pacemakers. And he says, well, I said, why did you buy this company? He says, he says the, I bought the building and the, and, and the airstrip for a quarter of a million dollars. And he said, the property is worth more than that. Now I've got a pacemaker company, and what do I do with it? And I, he said, what's wrong with pacemakers? I said, well, this was in 1970, that was, must have been 19, late 1970s. I said, well, none of them increase the pacing rate with your exercise. They just go on at, this, at the same rate. And I said, what we need is a, is a pacemaker that will sense exercise and increase the pacing rate. He said, how do you do that? I said, well, I'll tell you how to do that. Because uh, venous blood d d draining and exercising muscle is hotter than arterial blood. And the pacing electrode is in the right ventricle where all of the venous blood goes through. I said, all we've got to do is put a temperature sensor on there and sense the temperature of the blood. And we need to do a few studies uh, to find out how much temperature rise occurs with different levels of exercise. He says, how much? I said, 25,000, my usual bargain price. And he says, you got it. And, and uh, uh, we started work on it. And uh, we uh, showed that the uh, temperature rose quite a few degrees if you had, uh, have an animal on the treadmill. And so we got feasibility done and we uh, applied for patents. And uh, then the clinical studies were done in Japan and uh, Cook converted his factory uh, to an um, exercise responsive pacemaker factory and it was called Kelvin, which is the, the, the temperature scale. Mm -hmm. That's a good, good name. And they put about 3,000, implanted about 3,000 in patients, and they worked just fine. The competitor started to make them, and the competitor's exercise signal was vertical body motion. And uh, that would be fine if you're climbing stairs and doing things like that. But if you're riding in a, in a car on a bumpy road, the pacemaker thinks you're exercising. So we had the best, best pacemaker, exercise responsive pacemaker. Uh, that, that was in existence and the competition started to get upset and they started to lower their prices and they priced us out of business. Hmm. So he, he closed the, the plant and uh, nobody has uh, used the technology yet. It, it's patented and the patent is probably expired by now. Mm -hmm. Did you get the patent for that? Yes. Uh -huh. And the, the company? Du 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 du. Uh -huh. And the license to cook. Yeah. But the company is not uh, making those anymore? No. When? No, okay. they closed okay. down okay. because it was not, uh, not cost effective. Okay. How about the portable electrocardiograph, the patients for monitoring? That was a fun thing to do. Uh, uh, we realized that uh, 
you get a lot of information from feeling the pulse, palpating the pulse, and uh, uh, listening to the heart sounds. And that, that tells you that the heart has an abnormality, but you don't know what, what the abnormality is. So we decided that a, a pocket-sized pacemaker should be the accompaniment to the stethoscope. So we built a pocket-sized pacemaker that, uh, that um, you just put on, put on the chest and there was a liquid crystal display and here's your ECG. And, and you could plug it into a, into a recorder and get a graphic record of it if you wanted. There was 40 seconds of memory. And so we got a patent on that. It's called PAM, Personal Arrhythmia Monitor. And so a, a, a fellow took a license and he didn't know a thing about electrocardiograms. And he got a super salesman who didn't know much about electrocardiograms, but he could sure sell units. And uh, the trouble was that the, the licensee didn't know uh, what, uh, what value the electrocardiogram itself had. And he had lots of customers say, add an oximeter, add blood pressure. So he spent a whole bunch of money modifying this device to do other things than, it, than what it was attended, intended for, and he went out of business because somebody else came in and produced a similar device, not quite as good, but uh, it did the same job, and he went out of business. Mm -hmm. I lost some money. I lost $20,000 on that. I invested in the company. I, I was so happy with it. Hmm. And your licensing, uh, does Purdue help when uh, you're licensing, or how does Purdue, that come? Purdue controls the licensing. Okay. Yeah. But you can give them some names or... You yes, know, they, so. they ask you for potential licensees, because mm -hmm. the Office of Technology Commercialization doesn't know the field as well as the inventor. Sure. So they solicit the inventor. Right. Okay. How about the miniature cuff? This is the one for the uh, premature infants. Oh, that was a fun thing to do. That, uh, that uh, was... Uh, a result of, uh, I had a, a graduate student who was working on something else and it, and, and, and it wasn't working. And uh, she was knocking herself out, Be Rebecca Rader is her name. She was knocking herself out and uh, I thought, well, we gotta give her a success. So I had been, I had done blood pressure on small animals, on rats and, and, and dogs uh, and on the tails. I'd done big, big animals too. But I just, the smaller the animal, the smaller the signal and with the, with the method I used. And I decided, hey, the way to change that is to use an optical sensor, because the smaller the, the member, the bigger the signal. So we use an optical sensor to measure the pulse and a, and a cuff. And uh, we, were, we were smart enough to add an, a couple of other things to it. Uh, we added, we could get systolic mean and diastolic pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. I had two graduate students doing the, the, the um, sensors. Rebecca Rader did the blood pressure, and Andre, Andre Kemene uh, did the uh, oxy oxygen saturation. We patented it, and uh, it, it, it was licensed to an Indiana company. They got money from, uh, from the 21st century but they made a bad, bad marketing decision. They decided to, the, the, the adult market was better, and it's bigger, and it does not work on adults. I told them that, and they, 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 they contract, uh, uh, they defaulted on the contract, and we got the license back. And we got not only the license back, we got the equipment they made, but they never tried it on, on infants and, and premature infants and infants. Uh, but it was just a bad marketing decision. And that was what it was pro uh, done, it could be used for, was that? Pardon? Well, that was what it was to be used for. Yes, exactly. It was right. designed for smaller Small. and smaller people. Right, yeah. And it worked great. And we, we tried it out at Riley, and it worked there very nicely. They were supposed to do studies at Riley, but they, they didn't do them. The physician they hired was an adult emergency physician. He was a nice guy, but he was, he was forced into applying the device for which it was not intended. So we're looking for a licensee now. We've got several potential licensees, but we're going to sp spend a little more time seeing that the licensee will use it as it is, is intended. Well, intended for, okay, yeah. right. Uh, are we ready to switch? Okay. Broken my pick too often. <laughs> we all set? Okay. Um, the um, one other one, the uh, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, that device that you developed. Tell us a little bit about that one. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, uh, 
uh, we, uh, we have been doing uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation since about 1980. <coughs> and uh, uh, the, 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 our interest in it uh, stemmed from uh, a PhD uh, student who was a nurse. She was an RN on the Purdue faculty, and she was interested in cardiopulmonary resuscitation. <coughs> and uh, she uh, was watching, uh, we were doing pigs, uh, and she was wa we were doing a standard chest compression on pigs, and she noticed that when the chest was compressed, the abdomen bulged out. And so she decided that, uh, well, maybe she would push in when the abdomen bulged out. In other words, when the, when the chest was decompressed, she'd push on the abdomen. And uh, pleasantly surprised, the amount of blood flow that you could get doubled absolutely doubled and she published that in 1982 she got her PhD her thesis is on file <clears throat> and then uh, Dr. Babs who was a member of the team decided to get the American Heart Institute interested and they were uninterested and they still are uninterested well about a year ago I decided hey uh, one of the there are two problems with uh, with uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation one is the, if you're doing good cardiopulmonary resuscitation, you're going to break ribs. And the, and the uh, incidence of rib fracture is about 33% now. And the other, the other uh, bad thing about um, CPR, present-day CPR, is mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. You can, the risk of transferring infection from the patient to the, mm -hmm. to the rescuer is high. Some rescuers will not do mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing and a variety of thing, a variety of devices like face masks that will shield you from it, uh, from the mouth, uh, are, have been uh, developed. So with with the uh, recognition that uh, abdominal compression increases blood flow, I asked myself, what does ab abdominal compression alone do without the chest compression? So it produced more blood flow than chest compression. Then we asked ourselves. Well, it, since you're pushing on the abdomen, that pushes the, the, the abdominal organs against the diaphragm and pushes the diaphragm headward, and that causes expiration. And when, 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 when you let go of the, the uh, abdomen, the, the recoil produces inspiration. So we asked ourselves if, if, if the, the single act of abdominal compression and decompression could produce enough blood, blood flow and respiration at the same time. We did some experiments in the last year and you can produce more ventilation than, than is necessary. And we're in, in the process of, uh, uh, we had a grant application, it was funded, and we're applying for more funds. The last time we applied for funds for this combined OAC, only abdominal compression CPR, they turned us down. They didn't think it was meritorious enough. I've had two, two uh, government agencies turn, turn me down. And we're writing now another application to an agency that's looking for unusual things. It's called the Eureka Program. It's, it's not in the Heart and Lung Institute, it's in NIH. It's, it's developmental biology area. So we're writing an application and we've got uh, absolutely convincing data that uh, you have to be blind not to see it. Yeah, so right. we're, 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 uh, we're, we're not doing any studies now, but we will probably be funded by about a year from now. Okay, sounds good. Uh, one thing on the clinical trials, um, how do you go about those for the researchers get uh, from your experience? That's, uh, that's, that's an interesting uh, um, story. First of all, the FD, FDA requires that you have enough animal studies to, uh, to prove the feasibility. And then, and then uh, the university doesn't do the clinical trials, it's the licensee who does the clinical trials. And the licensee petitions the FDA for permission to do, say, X patients, maybe five or ten patients, and the patients would have to be uh, those who have no other alternative. They, they're going to die anyway, so you're going to try this on them. So uh, then, then you do that and, and uh, uh, get your data and take it to the FDA, and uh, they will give you permission. If everything's going well, they'll give you permission to do ten patients or twenty patients. Or if it's going real well, they'll give you permission to do studies in different centers. And you can get, you can, you can now get uh, human studies abroad. Uh, and the FDA will look at the data, providing the, the uh, controls in the uh, foreign country are adequate. We have a study running now in, in Vienna, Austria. Uh, and and it's, it's from one of our patents. Mm -hmm. 
and there's a study going on in and the other the similar studies going on in uh, in Philadelphia. Okay. All right. It's a CPR uh, monitor. Very good. Now we'd like to turn to July 27th, 2007, uh, the White House recipient of the National Medal of Technology from President Bush, in your own words. Total surprise. Total surprise. I didn't realize that uh, uh, people in, in, in this building, uh, now in this building, they were in Potter before, had started on uh, uh, nominating me and uh, getting letters of reference uh, two years earlier. and. Uh, uh, I didn't know anything about this, and uh, I didn't know I was being nominated. But I got a letter from a, a, a letter. It just said "Office of the President." It came in the mail, and and they they wanted my uh, they wanted my social security number. And I said, "This is for the birds. This is some smart merchandiser." So I called the FBI and told them, and I sent the letter to the FBI. And Joe Gelfand, uh, administrative assistant to Dr. Wodica, said, "Let me handle it." So she. Uh, she got on the phone and talked to uh, talked to uh, uh, the president's office, and it turned out that it was uh, Jeske who nominated me. And uh, she said, uh, this, "This is real. I couldn't believe it because she says, but we don't give out our we don't let our faculty give out our social security numbers. So I thought it was all over then. I, I still didn't believe it because I've had letters from uh, guys in South Africa saying." If you will open a bank account, I'll put half a million dollars in it, and you can keep one hundred thousand. And uh, that happened several times, so I, I just was real suspicious. So finally, uh, uh, Joe uh, Gelfand didn't give them the, the uh, social security number. I think they could get it from the in Internal Revenue. They could get it from the FBI. I've got all kinds of records. I've, I've got a top secret clearance. I, uh, the data are around, but uh, I thought this was just phony. And so uh, I got a phone call one night from the president's office about a week before, and he said, "This is for real." He says, "You're a nominee. I can't tell you if you're nominated yet, but I'll tell you in a couple of days." And it was uh, one of the secretaries of the president. And I got a call, and they said, "You are to be in uh, in Washington on on uh, what was it? Uh, September, no, August 27th, was it? July, July, July 27th." 20, July 27th. And I said, well, I can't really be there. I said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going cancer therapy. I had a little, I had a, 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 a basal cell carcinoma in my nose. And I said, I can't miss a day of therapy. So I said, well, they said, well, you've got to be there. I said, it's a once in a lifetime. So I checked with uh, David Lassiter. And I said, uh, I've got to go to Washington for the day. I just got to be back. I, I can't stay more, more than a day. So he arranged to uh, invite the president, the new president, President Cordova, and uh, I uh, invited my wife and uh, uh, my secretary and Joe Gelfand, the administrative assistant to the school. So we got the, the uh, Purdue jet and went over in the morning, and uh, uh, David Lassiter was, the, was the, the manager of the whole event, and he arranged everything perfectly. And we went. and. Uh, Got, it, got there in the morning, we uh, went to the White House and uh, uh, were interviewed. We got into the security, we had to show our passport, and they gave you a dog tag with a, with a little thing on it that tells you where you can go. And they have all kinds of people helping you there. They have ladies in black and white suits who are standing around, and you ask them where you, where you want to go, and they'll take care and show you. And they took us, and we went to the, we went to the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, uh, Strategic room where the where the uh, where the uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff meet, and they were it was just outside of where we were having uh, dinner. We had dinner in the executive dining room, and uh, Carl Rove came over, and uh, several of the people uh, that uh, were uh, White, House, White House officials. We had lunch, and then they they took me away because they wanted me to get in line for the uh, rehearsal for the uh, presentation. And there were two two series of presentations. One was the National Medal of, of Technology, and there were five of us got that. And there was a National uh, Science Medal, and there were several more got got that. And we were on two sides of the room, and uh, we went in there, and we were we we had a t attendees to look after us. And uh, the fellow that sat on my right was the guy who invented the laser. The fellow that sat on my left invented a little microphone in all telephones. So it was an interesting bunch of people. 
And it came time to, to uh, get the presentation, and George Bush was up on, on the stage, and there was a, there was a military person there assisting a, a, a however, however needed, and then there was a person who, who read the citation. And you came up, and, uh, uh, and then Dr. George Bush put the, uh, the medal on, and we chatted. And I, he's a very interesting guy to talk to. He's different than he is on TV. Uh, he's a very hospitable, entertaining. And uh, I said, uh, I said uh, to George Bush, I said, I'd like to tell you a, a good Texas story. He said, sure, go ahead. So I told him, I said, when you see a turtle on the fence post, you know, he had a lot of help getting there. And he laughed, and I said, I am the turtle on the fence post. And he says, great. And I said, I'll tell you how to get an award. He said, tell me. And I said, well, you've got to do something that somebody thinks is, is important. You may not think it's important, but somebody thinks it has to think it's important. And he, I said, the second thing is you've got to not make too many enemies, because you need people to write letters of recommendation. He said, what's the third thing? I said, you've got to live long enough. He said, you've got all three. And then and he helped me off the stage. <laughs> oh, what, what an event. And then what happened afterwards? Did you meet, uh, was there a reception afterwards? Yes, there was a reception, and we met uh, with uh, Condoleezza Rice. She wanted to have a picture with me, so there's a picture of Condoleezza Rice, myself, and, 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 and Dr. President Cordoba. And then we met a lot of other people. I can't remember all of their names. Right. And then we went over to, this, to the Commerce Department, and, and they had a, a ceremony there uh, honoring, honoring us, and uh, their PA system was just awful. It was hard to hear, and we had to leave uh, just, just before the end of the ceremony to, to go to the Dulles Airport. We, we could not fly into to, uh, 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 the National Airport because all flights have to have a, a sky marshal on board. And so we flew in for, 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 for to Dulles, and we flew out of Dulles. And as we were go going to, the, got on the plane, the weather turned bad. Not at Washington, but en route. So we were delayed about half an hour, and we got home around about 8:30. Uh -huh. It was it, it, it was a nice opportunity to meet uh, President Cordova. She's a very interesting person. Good. So it was quite an event. Quite an event, yes. yes. Yeah. Any, uh, any closing comments that you'd like to share with us for the researchers for this? Well, uh, that I, 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 yes. It was uh, my pleasure. Yes. I can tell you, doing research is like peeling an onion. You, you peel off the layers of ignorance and you're crying all the time. And you finally get all the layers of ignorance off and you're down to the core of the truth. And, but, but sometimes it takes a long time to get there. So just hang in there, I guess, is my, my, my okay. recommendation. Good. Thank you very much. This okay. concludes the interview. Thank you, Dr. Geddes, and thank my, the my other pleasure. people, too. My pleasure.